Good morning and welcome to the 30th meeting in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask um, everyone in the room please to turn off their mobile phones and um, as they can often interfere with the sound system. And saying that, you will also note that uh, there are um, committee, uh, committee members and indeed clerks who are using tablet devices instead of the hard copies of their papers um, uh, here, here this morning. The first item on the agenda today uh, is a round table on e-cigarettes. Um, the committee has been waiting some time uh, to hold this exploratory session, which is the first we've had on this subject. Um, as usual with a round table, um, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves. Um, um, firstly, I should introduce myself as Duncan McNeil, MSP for Greenock Member Clyde and Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. I'm Andrew Thompson, I'm a GP in Angus um, and a member of the BMA's Board of Science, uh, UK and member of the uh, BMA Scottish Council. Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the Committee. I'm Jeremy Main from the Department of Health in England. Uh, Richard Simpson, I'm MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. My apologies for being late due to trains. Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Uh, John Britton, I'm a respiratory consultant in Nottingham and I'm director of the UK Centre for Tobacco and Alcohol Studies. Richard Lyell, MSP for the Central Region. Ailey McLeod, MSP for South Scotland. Claire McDermott, Tobacco Policy Team at Scottish Government. I am leading on the consultation on e-cigarettes and tobacco control. Colin Keir, MSP for Edinburgh Western. Catherine Devlin, President of ACETA, the Electronic Cigarette Industry Trade Association. Gil Patterson, MSP for Claybank and Mogai. Sheila Duffy from Ash Scotland. Rhoda Grant, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Thanks for that, everyone. Um, Richard, Lyle, will you... <laughs> Ask the first question and open up. As, as I should say to the, the, the panel, you know, we, do, we don't intend we'll do a question now, but we don't intend just to ask questions all the time, just a break in the conversation. And, and I, I will look to the panel members in preference to committee members for contributions at all stages through this session. Richard, please. Uh, thank you, Katina. Can I uh, also thank the committee for granting my request for uh, this session on e cigarettes? E cigarettes uh, are a new invention which has come on in the last number of years and there are concerns about uh, what is in e-cigarettes and also uh, what they are. Um, there are a number of uh, organisations who have made uh, comments about e-cigarettes, in particular can I refer uh, the committee to Young Scots supporting a smoke-free generation by 2034. They actually suggest, and I'll read it out uh, to be on the record, we want to see a ban on all the sale of e-cigarettes in shops and retail outlets. The product must be regulated and distributed as a medicinal product only. But I, I'd like to turn to the question um, in regards to uh, the Scottish Government's uh, uh, position in regards to e-cigarettes and possibly I could ask Claire McDermott to explain. It is my understanding there's no law against selling this to children, but it is self-regulating. But as we know, if anyone walks into a shop, they may purchase uh, something. Uh, and it, it concerns me that children could walk into a shop and purchase an e-cigarette. I know the Scottish Government is considering a ban on the sale and is doing a, a consultation. Could uh, Claire tell us where we are in regard to the consultation? Yeah, um, the consultation launched on the 10th of October and will run until the 2nd of January. Um, we await programme for government in terms of what um, a legislative timetable might be for that um, but we will seek to um, consider the, the consultation responses as soon as possible but the Minister has made clear that he's committed, this is one area he's committed to, to bringing legislation forward on. Can I, thank you for that. Can I ask the, the wider uh, panel? Well, see if we can get a response to some of the other things, uh, uh, Richard uh, yeah. you know, because you mentioned um, the, the recommendation to ban these cigarettes I think there's some UK legislation already in place for that. Can we have some comment and feedback to Richard's general questions at the uh, at the, the, the beginning? I, mean, I think a number of questions arise out of that. Um, would, there, would there be any questions? Catherine, Devlin. I feel like I ought to respond on this one, uh, representing the industry as I do. Um, 
just in the broadest possible terms, if I may, though, I think with the precautionary principle, as expressed by the concerns that you've raised and the suggestions that you've raised, we have to be enormously careful that we don't do more harm than good. Um, and we've been very pleased to see the Scottish Parliament's approach to this, which is to consult widely and bring forward very few ideas initially and take time to gather further evidence before doing anything too drastic. The risk, if we were to remove everything from the market, is that we will see all those people who've made the switch to electronic cigarettes potentially returning to tobacco smoking, which would clearly not be good for public health on a population level or for those individuals. What's up? Oh, it, oh, it just, just did it. Um, I, I, would, I would agree with Catherine. I, I have no, I should say up front, I have no uh, financial or any other conflict of interest or in, interest in, in what the industry has to say on this. But electronic cigarettes offer a huge potential benefit to public health by helping smokers to shift to an alternative source of nicotine. And if all smokers in Britain were to do that, we would be talking of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of premature deaths avoided. So it's very important, I think, when legislating and controlling the inevitable abuses of the market that will come with electronic cigarettes and the inherent risks in the, pro in the products, which we know relatively little about still, though we do know that they're much less hazardous than tobacco, it's important to manage those risks but not in a way that throws the baby out with the bathwater because there is a huge potential public health prize in these products. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. And um, I would agree with uh, what John has said in the context that UK government has taken an approach um, which is as evidence-based as possible, recognising that there isn't as much of an evidence base as we would like to make good decisions in relation to this category of products. But what we have tried to do is to think about the risks and the benefits. So rather than banning a product which, as John says, has great potential, we've taken a more measured approach, thinking about what regulatory framework and structure is necessary to enable these products to be made available. Thinking about risks and benefits, the position that the uh, Department of Health have taken is that continuing to smoke is the riskiest thing that anyone can do and costs 80,000 lives a year uh, in the UK. So anything that can help to manage those risks are important that we evaluate carefully and think about the potential for benefits. As John said, the, the market is such that we can't be confident that the range of products available are safe and therefore can't recommend their use to people. But what we don't want to do is to remove from the market something that has potentially a great value if the regulatory framework is such that we can be confident that the products are of quality and will help people to cut down, to quit and to reduce the harm of smoking. But do, do, we, do we, yes, claim it, claim it? I um, probably likewise um, recognise um, and develop in the consultation paper the, the potential for e-cigarettes um, to act as a cessation tool. However, um, we do, as Catherine said, we don't feel that there's enough evidence um, yet to make a decision on electronic cigarettes. Um, and that's why we asked the question in the consultation document. We're still seeking people's views to inform future policy development um, and just to highlight, one of the reasons we didn't um, take action just now is in recognition that individual um, organisation service providers can act to implement their own policies um, if there was felt that there was an urgent need um, to, to have um, e-cigarettes banned in their premises. Okay. Is it, the, I think Richard made the, 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 the point about... Um, the sale of this to children and young people in terms of, I mean, I think we're clear on the effects of nicotine on, 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 on that group, are we not? Or a younger group? Yes, Jim, if I could just make a point yeah. um, picking up on that. Um, first to say that in the UK we will be consulting very shortly on an age of sale restriction of 18 and a proxy, proxy purchase prohibition so for adults buying these products for 
um, younger people. Um, and those regulations, uh, if passed, will be in place uh, next year. Um, so that's the, the intention in the UK. I think John is probably better placed to talk about um, the impact of uh, these products on younger people. Um, I think none of us would want any of our own children or anybody else's children to start using nicotine for no good reason, um, which includes electronic cigarette use and, of course, includes smoking. And I don't know what the figures are for, the, for Scotland, but certainly across Britain, uh, by the age of 25, 40% of people have been smokers and 25% still are. So we have the dilemma in young people's use of electronic cigarettes of if it's young people using electronic cigarettes who would never have become smokers, then that's a, a negative step for their health and for population health. If the use is predominantly among young people who would otherwise smoke or are already smokers, then the same potential benefits come to them as come to adults who make the switch. So I think it's a very difficult balance to make at the moment the evidence from um, the, uh, Robert West smoking, no, he doesn't look at children, sorry, from the ASH surveys carried out by, uh, surveys based on, uh, I think carried out by YouGov, the evidence from young people is that use among never smokers is extremely low, of the order of one or two percent. Catherine, there. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, to, to make it very clear to, to the committee that we've always asked for a mandated aid restriction. We introduced the voluntary code in 2010. Um, we're very pleased to have seen that it's gone wider than our membership. But we, we absolutely support the mandating of an aid restriction for this. The difficulty that we're hearing from enforcement officers and indeed retail colleagues who are out there in the marketplace um, selling these products is that without it being mandated, the voluntary code is not enforceable because retail outlets into which a, a, a members or a, a seller's products are placed, they will not necessarily respect it unless it's a mandated aid restriction. So we do support that, while obviously completely agreeing with Professor Britton's perspective on, on the benefits, potential benefits to children who are already smoking. That said, I think it's really important that the committee recognise that there should be, or they should seek to be, no difference between the treatment of the nicotine-containing electronic cigarettes and those that don't contain any nicotine. And to date, all of the regulatory proposals and frameworks that we've seen from pretty much anywhere in the world, unfortunately, fail to make that clear at all. So that the, the products that don't contain any nicotine are left frequently outside of regulatory discussions. We think that's a significant mistake because at the end of the day these are products for inhalation and just as with the nicotine containing ones we would not like to see children being sold non-nicotine containing electronic cigarettes either. Thank you. Yes Richard? Can, can I make crystal clear I'm, I'm not attacking e-cigarettes. Uh, I know a number of smokers within this building who have actually given up and have been on e-cigarettes. I'm not one of them. Right, that's a confession I've got to make. But uh, the basic situation, I, I turn to uh, Professor Britton's comment, and I, I hope I've I'm, I'm wrote it down right. We know little of what is in the cigarette. Can you explain to us what is in the cigarette? That's a concern that people have. What is within the liquids? I know you can get licorice, strawberry, raspberry, or whatever flavours you want. What else is in that liquid? Okay, the, the basic recipe, if you like, is that it's predominantly propylene glycol, which is well understood. It's been studied for many years, and Professor Ritten's perhaps more in a position to talk to that than I am. Um, you have vegetable glycerin, or glycerol, which again is fairly well understood. These are both grass, generally recognised as safe. You have a very, very small concentration of nicotine. I, I use a quite a high concentration at 2.4%, so very low nicotine. Um, and you have flavourings. Now, these are usually food flavourings. Although in the case of tobacco flavours, there are sometimes um, flavourings from Tobacco Absolute, which obviously falls outside of food flavouring uh, standards. Um, there can be food colourings in some of them. Um, and we're in the process at the moment, as the committee may be aware of, of creating a, a pre-standard, a publicly available specification with the British Standards Institute, um, which seeks to include emissions gathering and analysis so that we can not only know and understand fully what's actually there in the liquid, but also, far more importantly, what's delivered to the user 
in the vapour that you inhale. So we're looking at gathering the emissions, analysing the analytes that are present in that emission, and then also doing a full toxicological health risk assessment on that, so that we will have a better understanding of the impact on the human body from using the product. And it is with a certain amount of shame that I can't provide that data to you today before the products went on sale. That is an error, that is a mistake. We should have done this already. But it's been a process of growth for this industry. They are, many of the businesses in the sector are not sort of professional businesses. They're often made by, created by vapors who just got really excited about the products and then decided to create a business. And now it's, it's necessary to, to try and push some standards on them to enforce, force the standards up so that they can know exactly what went into the product, what comes out of it, and what effect that's going to have on the human body. I think part of the problem with this debate is we're not talking about one standard product. We're talking about up to 500 brands and well over 7,000 flavourings. And some of those flavourings, although approved for food use, work quite differently in the body when heated and inhaled. So I think um, our position has been that we would love to see people who are addicted to tobacco being able to use these products instead of tobacco or to quit a tobacco addiction. But um, there are so many unknowns, and I think uh, the little evidence that we have supports both an optimistic and a cautious approach at the moment. So we believe that regulation needs to look at maximising the potential benefits and minimising the potential harm. And these products must work towards our vision for a generation free from tobacco in 2034. Andrew. Thank you. Um, it's, it's very heartening as, as a GP to, to hear um, the, the view of the industry that uh, you want also to, to make sure that these are not available to, to our children. Um, certainly my interest as a, as a clinician was first sparked in this when I had a parent come in with a primary school um, child who'd been found in the playground with, a, with an e-cigarette. Um, and that just, that's on wrong on so many different levels. Um, so I'm very keen for, for this to be removed. I'm very keen not to see in, in shops and displays this at, at sort of a children's height to be able to take these sort of primary coloured um, uh, products um, and take it off the shelf and, and find out what they are. Also to move to actually get the, the, the capsules, um, the, the actual nicotine containing liquid into a child safe form. Um, so there's no risk to our children that they may accidentally get hold of this and, and ingest this. Uh, because although, yes, nicotine is uh, can cause vomiting and things in, in overdose. It's not guaranteed that actually the child will bring this up and, and may suffer harm <coughs> excuse me, due to nicotine. It's also heartening to, to hear that uh, the, the industry are keen to do a, a full health uh, uh, study um, on, on industry. Um, my concern as a clinician is, is, um, is that not sort of uh, after the horse has bolted, um, you know, the, the, the huge use of this and yet we don't have good evidence as to, as to the safety of these. I absolutely accept that uh, e-cigarettes, um, you know, will do less harm than, than continued tobacco use, but I'm concerned that this doesn't always take uh, someone who is using tobacco and take them down the path to either 100% e-cigarette usage or uh, quitting nicotine altogether as an addiction. Um, there's emerging evidence, certainly, that um, e-cigarettes are being used to reduce someone's reliance on tobacco, but actually possibly then maintaining that tobacco use longer. And the evidence, certainly in terms of clinical harm, is that the length of period of using tobacco is actually potentially more harmful than the intensity of using tobacco, and therefore that's a, a significant concern. There is a need, and certainly the BMA are very keen to, to see a, a development, quick development, uh, or as quick as research ever allows, uh, of uh, uh, more evidence ar around this, to the point that I, as a GP, can feel confident to recommend this product to my patients as part of a nicotine uh, uh, replacement therapy and as part of uh, smoking cessation. But that has to be as part of the, the whole gambit. The, the evidence on all other than nicotine replacement therapies is that they're more effective when they're combined with behavioral therapies rather than just being able to, to be taken off the supermarket shelf. So we need to, to actually use this as a, as a product to help reduce the impact of tobacco and not take our eyes off the fact that actually you know, this huge amount of harm, as, you, as you've demonstrated, uh, of, of, of uh, tobacco use in the UK. Uh, so I want to see a, a, a state where the evidence is there, but that evidence is going to take a very long time to develop, and I think we need to be brave and move forward faster than that. Uh, 
Uh, Catherine Devlin and then uh, uh, Professor Pratton. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut across you, John. Um, <clears throat> several points raised there. Thank you, Andrew. Um, first of all, child resistance. Um, that's actually requ been required by law um, up until July this year when we found that actually it's not for the products that are under 2.5%, but of, of, in our code and in our standard, we are in insisting on that still. So there should be no product containing nicotine out there that is not child resistant. Um, and indeed, for our members, we do actually verify that. We check that with a government expert to make sure that it is. Um, there's a significant difference between quitting smoking and quitting nicotine use. Nicotine, as I'm sure Professor Britton would agree, is, is very similar to caffeine in terms of, of its dependence potential and its effect on the body. So actually, quitting smoking is essential for the health benefits. Quitting nicotine, not such a big issue in our view. Um, then also, the notion of t continuing tobacco use. Of course, using an electronic cigarette is not tobacco use. Tobacco use is, is where you've got the potential sort of health risks and so forth. But the continued use of e-cigarettes removes the harms associated with smoking of tobacco. So it's, it's not quite the same um, issue. Um, and then finally, the behavioural support point, just very quickly, I'm sorry. Um, Louise Ross at the Leicester Stop Smoking Service has seen some very significant um, success with recommending um, electronic cigarettes. Well, not so much recommending, but educating her clients about electronic cigarettes and making it possible for them to access these products. But I totally agree with you that we need more research and we need to move fast on it. Thank you. Um, just one point of clarification on the caffeine point. I would agree that nicotine is probably about as hazardous as caffeine in terms of harm to the body. It's in the same order of magnitude. I think nicotine is probably more, nicotine addiction is harder to break, I suspect. Um, I would just pick up on, on two points from Andrew. One was the, the dual use concern and the other the, the behavioural support issue. On dual use, um, that's an argument which has been advanced very widely against electronic cigarettes, that they are encouraging people to continue to smoke but just use the electronic cigarette at times where it's difficult to smoke. But on the other hand, we actually actively... Uh, recommend and encourage dual use of licensed nicotine products for use in exactly the same way. A nice, ever, nice uh, guidance on harm reduction, PH45, which came out at the beginning of last year, I think, does the same. And the argument is that whilst cutting down on smoking, I agree, probably has trivial impact on health outcomes because it's the first cigarette of the day that does most of the damage. It's more complex than that, but there's a certain truth in that. What we do know is that people who dual use are far more likely to proceed to quit smoking than people who don't. So I think it's just the learning that if I can go for four hours through a meeting, say a morning here, and not smoke by using an electronic cigarette, then why can't I do all day? So there's a learning process in that, and we encourage it with NRT, and it seems to me uh, completely wrong to call it a bad thing for electronic cigarettes. The other issue is behavioural support. I entirely agree with Andrew that if you want to give up smoking, you are most likely to succeed if you use proper pharmacological support, which in my view can include electronic cigarettes, and as a clinician I do recommend them. Um, for people who have tried nicotine product, medicinal products before and haven't found them satisfactory or other medication plus behavioural support. But the fact is that each year only about 8 or 9% of our smokers go into those services. The other 90% struggle on their own. What electronic cigarettes do is make that first step towards substituting cigarettes possible for people without engaging with medical services. Now, I agree, the more that we could persuade to go through the, the full Monty of NHS support, the better. But I would much rather that smokers who are not otherwise going to engage with that try an electronic cigarette and realise maybe there is a way out of smoking here um, than not at all. Robert West has described smoking as being like in a nightclub when the fire breaks out. You just need a way out. It doesn't matter what it is. And electronic cigarettes could well be a way out for many smokers who would not otherwise find an exit. Andrew, you want to say, and then uh, Mr. Yeah. I'll bring you Andy up. I think uh, John has, has clarified my, my point in terms of the, the dual use. I think perhaps a sort of mis misunderstanding on the point I was making there. Um, I, I, I absolutely recognise that dual use is something that we've promoted and, and is promoted in the NICE uh, recommendations for, for nicotine replacement therapies currently. 
um, but that's in conjunction with behavioural therapy with an aim to uh, reach a, a tobacco uh, cessation date. Um, so it's far more, you know, far more a, a pathway to to quitting any use of tobacco, whereas that's I feel less in place with with e-cigarette uh, use. Um, and I think it is it is a learning process, as you say, it's a learning process um, that well, I've managed to go four hours without uh, without uh, without tobacco, then actually I can go a bit longer, and perhaps I can move to, to e-cigarettes. Um, but part of that learning process is, as as you agree with me, um, the behavioural support that's that's built into that um, to actually help you gain that learning, as opposed to just this this happening by by default. In terms of me as a clinician recommending, I mean, I'm very much the sort of first do no harm, and at the moment I still have a lack of confidence about the absolute safety of e-cigarettes to take me to the point that I will actually be recommending to my patients to use an e-cigarette. Of course, if a patient comes to me and says they are currently using an e-cigarette because they've found no other way to, to do it, I'm not going to turn around and say, well, actually, no, you should stop that and, and start increasing your tobacco use again. Of course I'm not. Um, but actually, I think uh, you know, it's a step, a step further for me to actually come out and as a, as a GP recommend to my patients that they should be using e-cigarettes because uh, there, there is a lack of evidence in terms of being absolutely sure in my mind that they're not causing any harm. What's that mean? And then uh, Sheila Duffy. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Just perhaps picking up on, on that point about um, harm and uh, how to proceed, whether a cautious approach or a, a sense of urgency um, uh, to take action. Um, the evidence base isn't as clear as we would like. Um, and certainly, um, if there was clear evidence, it would be easy and we'd be, we would be able to take decisions rapidly. But in fact, we, we don't know enough about the safety of the products. We don't know enough about their long-term impact. We don't know whether dual use is the same as nicotine replacement therapy. So that's why we've taken a cautious approach to regulation. We have defined areas where we think it is important to take action in terms of uh, age of sale and in terms of advertising restrictions. The code of advertising practice um, ha has just been brought in um, new, uh, a new regime um, to ensure that advertising for these products is targeted towards adult smokers, not bringing people or young people um, into use of the products. But we do need to proceed with some caution it might be just worth flagging that um, the Tobacco Products Directive, which is due to be implemented um, across the UK in 2016, will have a range of measures in place which will give greater reassurance about this variability in the range of products on the market. It will have standards for the, um, the contents of the products, for notification, for uh, labelling for packaging, for electrical safety, for enforcement arrangements. And we're hoping that that regime will allow um, healthcare professionals to be able to recommend trying these products. I think an important point um, is that um, with the smoking population still at around 8, 8 million people in the UK, one size doesn't fit all. And we need a range of measures to help people out of smoking so that we can look forward to a tobacco-free generation. Sheila Duffy. I think one of the very harmful forces within this whole debate is the tobacco industry, which has buy, been buying up these companies and technologies as if they were sweeties. And so we have uh, Boots retailing an Imperial tobacco brand. We have Lloyd's Pharmacy retailing a British American tobacco brand. We have Rangers and Celtic being sponsored by Elites, which was bought up by Japan Tobacco International. Now, with 98% of their profits coming from Lit Smoke Tobacco in the foreseeable future, I think we have to be very conscious about how this deceitful, manipulative industry operates and watch very closely what their long-term strategy is for these products. Catherine Devon. Thank you. Um, on the question of big tobacco's involvement in our sector, obviously this is something that we've been watching very closely um, and with a certain amount of trepidation. Um, but it's very important to remember that there are at the moment a handful of e-cigarette brands that are owned by big tobacco companies and hundreds and hundreds, I mean, approaching 500 different brands that are totally independent of the tobacco industry. Um, so really, this is their Kodak moment. They've recognised the threat, but they are the few, we are the many, and I think it's highly unlikely that the tobacco industry is going to have control over this sector into the future. What we can all hope for, though, as part of a move towards 
a tobacco-free generation that hopefully goes a bit further than Scotland and the UK, is that Big Tobacco recognises the need to move away from selling combustible products at all and moves fully into harm reduction products and nicotine delivery in a clean way so that they can change their business model for the future and stop doing so much harm. Where the market have they got rather than the number of companies as against? I don't have data on that, but yeah. I can see if I can find out for you yeah. and, and submit this to the committee okay. afterwards. Sheila, you want to come back to that? Um, yes, just to say there is a very good page on the website Tobacco Tactics that makes clear which tobacco companies own which brands. And the, um, the guy in charge of the Scottish arm, which was Skysig, was bought over by Laurelard, the US tobacco giant, and is being taken over by Imperial Tobacco UK, has made very clear that he intends to reduce the number of brands to about 10 in the foreseeable future. And he intends his brand, as he put it in The Guardian, to be the Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, Professor Burton. I think in a, in a market so big, and if electronic cigarettes are effective products, and many of them clearly are, it's inevitable that big players are going, the, the market's going to consolidate into far fewer brands. And it's clear that the tobacco industry will own many, if not ultimately all of them. But I think it is important, irrespective of what we think of the tobacco industry, and I'm certainly not here to stand up for it, uh, I think the, 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 what we need to prevent is people smoking tobacco. Our target is that. Our target is not the tobacco industry. Richard? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the issue of children, it's interesting that the Trading Standards Institute report, which we got in Spice, indicated that between 23% and 80% of retailers were selling to children. So despite the... the, 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 the um, the rules, self-regulating rules, this is not really applying. The, the industry may be saying it, but the retailers are not following that. And I think the fact that Boots and Lloyd's Pharmacy are selling these products when we don't yet know the potential and, and effect of them is, is I think, um, questionable, I would um, say. Um, can I take it that, first of all, that everybody's agreed that we actually need to have an effective uh, European-wide research program funded into the potential for short-term harm, because this is an addictive product, and I slightly disagree with John Britton. I think nicotine is substantially more addictive than caffeine, uh, and we don't know what its long-term harm is in terms of potential for possibly dementia, as has been suggested. That we need to have research into, uh, do we need to have research into the pathways? In other words, is it taking people onto smoking, or is it taking them off smoking? And we need to have long-term research into, into things. Is that something that everybody would be in agreement with? So that's my first question. That is your question, yeah. Um, can we have some responses, please? Catherine, <laughs> Professor Britton, and then uh, Shirley Duff. Thank you. Um, purely on the question of research, research, research is always good. We always want more research. However, I think especially if it's going to be some sort of Europe-wide research programme, it would need to be very, very carefully constructed because what we've seen so far from the European institutions has not been terribly impressive, to be fair. So Anyone we'd need else? to make sure that it was shaped properly. Professor Britton. Yeah. Um, I, every, I, I, I am a researcher and uh, primarily, and so anybody... I'm not going to disagree with anybody who says we need more money for research. However... <laughs> Um, I fully agree that we need uh, to watch very carefully patterns of use because if we see disturbing trends in the way that young people are using these products or whatever, we need to act on that. And unless you have regular, almost monthly, certainly three monthly monitoring systems in place, that will be missed. But on the long-term effects of nicotine, we know a great deal from the long-term effects of oral tobacco use in Scandinavia, where people have used uh, oral tobacco which still delivers nitrosamines and is not a harmless product by any stretch of the imagination to the body for many decades. But over decades of use, we know a lot about the risk potential or the, the pattern of risk in lifetime users as opposed to non-lifetime users. And whilst I can't say there is no risk, the risk is very, very low. Sheila Duffy. 
Um, I agree, certainly we do need the research. There are a lot of long-term unknowns. Um, I think we also need to be clear about the funding for the research um, because there is a long, well-documented history of tobacco industry-funded research which doesn't hold to the body of general science when tested. Claire McDermott. I think mine was just um, a word of caution. and We have been considering quite a lot of evidence in developing the consultation document. Um, and whilst um, always more research would be be great. Um, it's what can be achieved in a short period of time. Some of the research that's required around um, cessation and health impacts can't be, you know, we won't get anything <coughs> robust in the short term, that that'll take a number of years to come forward. Okay. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, obviously I support uh, increasing research. Um, uh, European research very welcomed with with all the caveats that, that as others have included um, but very much support this ongoing monitoring uh, and also not um, sort of selling ourselves down a European research line that's going to take a very long period of time to do if we're able to mobilize good quality research in the UK uh, and in Scotland faster then actually that's what we should get behind in you know, in parallel with, with pushing for, for European-wide uh, research. Um, and certainly uh, any trends, especially if it's any trends towards uh, seeing uh, this as a gateway product, is, is absolutely something that we need to seize and seize very quickly um, to, to stop that as a, as a potential trend. I know that the evidence is, is, is weak there at the moment, uh, but certainly that is a, you know, that is a potential risk of uh, you know, a gateway product or indeed normalising the, the image of, of smoking again. Professor Britton. That point also about the importance of monitoring and also research based in the UK. Um, Stan Glantz, who is a very eminent <coughs> public health uh, and outspoken public health specialist from California, once and I think intentionally disparagingly described the UK as a natural, as has allowed itself to become a natural experiment in tobacco harm reduction. I think he meant that to be an insult, but is actually, I think, a great. Uh, tribute to the fact that we've taken a much more open mind about electronic cigarettes than most other countries and we are therefore in a position to do research here that just can't be done anywhere else because we are so far advanced down the line of, of trying to use to realize the potential of these products so I would endorse the priority for research is 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 national Robert West runs a, an excellent survey um, facility of a rolling survey of smokers, including electronic cigarette use. It's called Smoking in England, and if, of course it is, does only relate to England. But that kind of survey work can tell you patterns of use very, very quickly. And I think it's vital that all of the, uh, of the components of the United Kingdom do that. Very brief question, Richard. We agreed a timetable. Yeah, earlier, brief, brief supplementary. And, um, um, I understand that from one of the ASH surveys that 50% of 15-year-olds have tried e-cigarettes. Uh, so my question, supplementary question is, will Salsus, the Scottish Survey of Adolescent Lifestyle, in, does it now include an e-cigarette question and how soon will we get information on that? Uh, so it's probably more one for Claire to answer, but yes, it does include a, a question on e-cigarette use and I believe it's coming out uh, very shortly. Thanks for that, Nanette. Richard was saying about, about young people uh, buying uh, e-cigarettes. E I mean, I'm a little bit worried about the flavourings of these things because, I, I mean, I can remember being put off cigarettes for life by one puff when I was a child because the taste was so awful. But if there's something being produced that's got a pleasant taste, I can foresee children wanting to dabble in it and find out which flavour they like best and so on and, and thereby um, developing the habit. Has anyone any comments about that? what we can do about it. Sheila. Um, I believe these are perfectly set up to be a starter product um, for children because they are smooth. Uh, they are, the flavourings, some of them are, seem to be tailor-made for children. Uh, they're high-tech, they're glitzy. So I think there are real concerns there. Um, I think uh, we haven't solved the question of whether they could be a gateway into smoked tobacco, particularly if the higher strength nicotine e-cigarettes are more restricted. I think um, we must not forget the tobacco epidemic, which is claiming some 13,000 lives in Scotland every year. And that is an epidemic that this committee should not be distracted from. And e-cigarettes should not be allowed to be a distraction from that, tackling that and tackling the availability and the supply of the more harmful product. There you go. I think we've got a few hands up there. The e-cigarettes are a distraction. <laughs> Catherine Devlin, I'm going first Professor John Sassy. <laughs> I keep cutting across you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
John is far better qualified than I to discuss the relative merits of flavourings, but I would just like to make the point that adult smokers who switch to using electronic cigarettes and switch away from tobacco-flavoured e-liquids find that it is much, much harder to relapse to smoking. And relapse to smoking is one of the biggest drivers, I believe, of the tenaciously stubborn smoking prevalence figures that we continue to have. It's, it's all too easy for them to relapse back to smoking, whereas once you've made the switch and you've switched away from tobacco flavours to something that's fruity or sweet or totally different when you get your taste buds back, you can't go back to smoking. I've tried. It doesn't work. It's revolting. So you stay off the smoking, which is the ultimate goal. Professor Britton? Um, I, I don't know what's best about the flavours. I've heard what Catherine has said, said to me by, by some of my patients too. Um, but at the same time, I agree with Sheila that these things look to be set up to be attractive to young kids. And none of us wants primary school children using electronic cigarettes. We would be interested to know where that child got the cigarette from. Um, but I think that's why we need monitoring in place. And an annual survey isn't enough, uh, particularly if we... So we'd be treading a very um, difficult path in how, unless you prohibit all advertising, which isn't the case at the moment, is the advertising that's recently been allowed... I don't know whether the... Does the CAP guidance apply for Scotland too? Yeah, so it happened here last week as well as in, in England. Um, is that going to appeal to young smoke, young people or not? And we only find that by monitoring very carefully and very frequently the behaviour and use of, of these products. So I, I, th I just don't know on, on flavouring, but I think the answer is to measure who's using it and, and at what age. There's a, there's, a, there's a couple of things that, that I would like to ask. In terms of you know, the cessation policies that we've got in for... Um, you know, to help people stop smoking, apart from the support that supposedly goes alongside that. They're all based on nicotine replacement and all of the level of... So what, what does that... Nic what's the difference between that nicotine getting into a body, into someone's body through a patch or, or vaporising it? Is there... I can think I can answer that. Nicot nicotine is... If you swallow nicotine, it's absorbed into the bloodstream, passes through the liver and most of it's destroyed. So it gives you heartburn and it makes you feel a bit queasy but it doesn't get in, in high levels into the blood. If you inhale nicotine, it's absorbed across the lung surfaces into directly into the bloodstream and straight to the brain so you get a hit very quickly. To avoid, we don't have a medicinal inhalation product. Uh, to avoid the, yet, to avoid the breakdown in the liver, you have to absorb, give medicinal nicotine through routes that involve absorption to blood supply or blood circulation that doesn't track through the liver, which means skin or the nose or the mouth or the other end of the GI tract. And all of them are absorbed very slowly, much more slowly than something that you inhale. Yes, so uh, apart from the speed... I respect that. Just it's the entry system. Whether the, 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 apart from the speed, but the, the, the nicotine levels that you would get through vaporising or patches there are, are very, there are very two, similar. Two key things that cigarettes do. One is that they deliver nicotine to the brain extremely quickly, and the second is that they deliver very high doses. But if you, if you, Without, take, out, if you take out the cigarette and compare vaporising with nicotine patches. The, right, the early generation cigarettes were all pretty hopeless, I think, and delivered fairly little nicotine, at best on a par with the Nicorette inhalator, which is an oral thing, but in, supposedly an inhalation device, but it works by delivering nicotine into the mouth. The second generation electronic cigarettes, the vaporizers, the ones that look less like cigarettes, not at all like cigarettes, um, do deliver higher doses, and it's a mixture of mouth and upper airway and probably some lung absorption. But I don't, haven't seen evidence yet to show that electronic cigarettes, any of them, have achieved the sort of lung absorption that a cigarette does. So there's still a long way to go. But these products are going to get a lot better, I think. Mr. Amin? Um, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to pick up on, um, on Sheila's point around the, the potential for a distraction in these products, but, but put that slightly differently. Um, my responsibility um, in the Department of Health is for tobacco control. 
And actually, there's a whole range of things that we can do to impact on smoking. So some of that is around nicotine replacement therapy, but it's also around other central nervous system drugs that are already developed or are in development. It's about cognitive, cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, uh, it's about um, the environment, so standardised packaging of tobacco products, advertising, availability. All these things impact on the smoking epidemic and are tools to help us to reduce the population that still smokes. Now, we could think of um, electronic cigarettes as uh, a distraction, or we could think of them as an opportunity. Different, different um, levers will work for different people. We need as many tools as possible in the toolkit to help. And that's why we've taken a cautious approach in England to recognise that there is an opportunity, it needs to be managed and the risks need to be managed as best they can, but it is an opportunity um, rather than something that we um, should not focus on. Uh, Catherine? It was really just to, to add to what Professor Britton was saying about the comparable nicotine between NRT licensed medication products and electronic cigarettes. Um, I think it's important for the committee to recognise that the nicotine is the same grade, so it's pharmaceutical grade nicotine that's used in both electronic cigarettes and in NRT products, and that's built into our standard, but that's already pretty much standardised across the industry anyway. Thank you. The, the, I'm going to ask other MSPs who have not spoken, Richard, if they want to ask any questions, and then if there's, if there's time, I'll, I'll, I'll let other people in again. The, one of the questions I was going to ask, if we haven't covered it, what, what justifies then a ban um, in the use of, of e-cigarettes in public places, given that if I've got to leave a public place or a pub or something to go outside and smoke, you know, an e-cigarette, why wouldn't I just go and have a cigarette? Hmm. Yes, please, Professor. Um, and then I'll take some I, I think it is... Electronic cigarettes, the, the legislation we have for cig cigarette smoking in, in enclosed public places was brought in primarily to protect people who work in those environments. Um, and the evidence on electronic cigarette use in indoor public places is that it does release nicotine into the atmosphere. It may well release some other uh, substances, some of which may be toxic into the atmosphere, and therefore it's not a completely clean, innocuous uh, product. However, the levels of those things are extremely low. Personally, I think it's a matter of courtesy not to use an electronic cigarette in, a, in this room, for example, as we speak. But I think to use law to say you cannot uh, use an electronic cigarette indoors does engender exactly the, same, exactly the process that you've just described. If you're, gonna, if you're treated like a smoker, you might as well be a smoker. And also, there are circumstances, controversial all of them, but potentially inpatient settings in general hospitals. My patients smoke electronic cigarettes under the sheets because they're not allowed to use them openly. Um, some of them do, uh, in mental health settings where the prevalence of smoking is incredibly high and has not shifted over the last 20 years. Prisons even, where, again, prevalence of smoking is extremely high and very difficult to control going smoke-free. I'm sure it can be done, but electronic cigarettes may be part of the solution. And so I would be very cautious about a legislative prohibition of electronic cigarettes in enclosed public places, though I would accept that the courteous thing for all electronic cigarettes to do is not to use them indoors. Okay. Anyway, well, Catherine Devlin. Thank you. Um, couldn't agree more, John, hence mine's in my bag and not in use. <laughs> um, I think the prison population example is, is a very good one. We, we've actually got a working example of that in Guernsey. They rolled out um, e-cigarettes being made available to the prisoners in Guernsey's prison uh, alongside NRT and behavioural support being offered to the prisoners there. And it's been very successful. They've been able to go completely smoke-free. Um, when it comes to mental health uh, institutions as well, there is a, quite a significant body of evidence supporting the fact that mental health patients, particularly schizophrenics, but all mental health disorders, find nicotine enormously helpful, which is why we tend to see these much higher prevalences of smoking in mental health patients. There are doctors here who I'm sure could attest to that far better than I. Um, when it comes to um, 
public spaces bans, however, I think we need to be very careful about our obligations to every citizen's human rights. Because if you have someone who wants to use an electronic cigarette and you say to them, OK, you can't use it in the building, you're going to need to go outside to the smoking shelter to use it, you're putting them in harm's way because you're effectively telling them to go and stand with the smokers with the known risks of passive smoking. Um, I agree with John, it shouldn't be mandated, it should be left to courtesy and for public policy decisions within each of the uh, businesses or, or buildings, owners or whoever to make that decision. But I think if you are going to suggest that you shouldn't have vaping in the building, you need to offer separate spaces for the smokers and the vapors. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, I was just to uh, see if there's any other person on the panel wishes to respond to that. Yep, Andrew. Oh, um, I mean, I, so, so, certainly the BMA were very uh, keen to see this included in, in the smoke-free public place uh, legislation. Um, we think that, uh, you yeah, know, Currently, there isn't evidence that, that these aren't harmful. Um, there is the, uh, the the imagery and the, the normalisation of, of this image of, of someone puffing, um, uh, you know, albeit a vapour, but these vapours are becoming more and more sort of uh, visible as, as people are using e-cigarettes and therefore actually telling the, telling the difference. I mean, that's partly why uh, companies like Weatherspoons have, have come out and, and, and banned this, because it's very difficult for their staff to, to ascertain, you know, who's, you know, is someone breaching smoke-free uh, legislation or is someone using an e-cigarette? That potentially puts them in harm's way in challenging uh, someone. Um, we'd be very keen, understanding absolutely the potential risks of, of putting someone in harm's way in terms of passive smoking, um, but we're not suggesting that that's a that's a solution. That's that's a implementation of this uh, beyond of, of actually having people uh, to have a space that they're able to use e-cigarettes uh, away from from the risks of passive smoking. Um, but we think very much that uh, currently having a dual standard here um, for for two forms of uh, of um, you know both tobacco use and e-cigarettes potentially undermines the, uh, the the current legislation on. Uh, um, smoking in enclosed public places, and we'd be very keen for this to be included. The industry certainly um, you know, purport to say that they're very much promoting these products only as uh, tools to help uh, decrease tobacco use. So they shouldn't be afraid of, of actually having these products treated in a similar way to tobacco. Um, and certainly the idea of, you know, going back to the, the flavourings, indeed Bluetooth connectivity of, of e-cigarettes and, and linking so you can play music and things like that. I mean, you know, these are clearly designed for, to, to capture a, a young audience um, and are not, not there as, a, as a, a tool to help reduce the impact of tobacco on society. But if there's no science to say that they're risky, but why, why does BMA say that they, sh they come to the... Why do you come off the fence and say, well, we can't prove that they're bad... But we can't prove they're good. So, but why did you fall on one side or the other? Because we we always fall on the side of uh, first do no harm. Um, that's the, the, the you know, our prime directive, if you like, as as a, as a doctor. Um, you know, we can't prove that these are safe, and we can't prove that these are safe to, to those around it and those working within uh, environments that you may well have a, a lot of people using e-cigarettes. And therefore, we wouldn't want to be um, sort of sitting on the side uh, where there is potentially harm. Um, so. We're you know, the, the benefit there is moving towards uh, the, the safest option um, and the safest option in, in our view is to include uh, e-cigarettes in the enclosed public places legislation. Jeremy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, the, the, the converse of that argument is that the riskiest thing to do is to continue to smoke. So anything that can help to um, bring people away from continuing to smoke tobacco um, is potentially helpful. In England, um, there is no current plans to extend the ban on um, smoke-free uh, public places to electronic cigarettes. The products are different. The risk um, associated with second-hand smoke is very clear, very evidence-based, and there certainly isn't the evidence to support treating two products uh, the same um, in the context of the level of risk um, of exposure to them. So there are no plans in England to extend the ban. We do, however, support the right of companies to uh, take action uh, within their premises, um, and there are a range of reasons they might, uh, they might wish to do so, um, including for ease of enforcement of the, um, the smoke-free legislation. 
we, I've also heard the arguments that um, there are different risks in different places. We heard um, about uh, prisons and mental health institutions. They are examples of places where the normalisation argument, for example, around children seeing products which look like a cigarette being used, don't apply. So there may well be different arguments for different settings. No other panel members? No Patterson. It's not that very point. Um, the one thing that's coming over clear to me is that no one so far has said that these products are safe. I, no, the, nobody knows. So the idea that you, you would uh, not put a ban in place similar to smoking, for me, would send a signal that they are safe, that we do know that they're okay. Uh, you know, and r rather than being proactive on it, particularly to, to in regards to children, um, that if it becomes commonplace, then, you know, being a person that's never, ever smoked in my life, but never uh, really worried about someone else uh, smoking, other than to encourage them knowing that they're damaging their health, to encourage them not to. So I, I've got a, kind of a weird attitude in these things, what, what people do, drinking and, and smoking. But certainly signals to me, are, are very important. Uh, don't go somewhere as a message. Don't go somewhere. Uh, and if you don't have the message, you're allowed to go. What's that mean? Karen, thank you. I, I think the important point that I would wish to stress is um, the UK government is not, rec the, the, the Department of Health in England is not recommending their use. In fact, the Chief Medical Officer uh, for England has expressed concern about particularly children and young people and the potential for gateway. But the reason we've taken a cautious approach is tobacco is so harmful, killing 80,000 people um, a year in the UK. That's something like 200 people each and every day. It's more harmful than alcohol, than obesity, than lack of exercise, than any other public health objective. It is the singest, biggest killer. And for that reason, we need to do all we can to support tobacco control. And if this is potentially helpful, we need to take a cautious approach to enable it, rather than to ban something without sufficient evidence. Can I clear the question up? Uh, convener, be convener, before anyone... Convener. Sorry. Hi. Um, these are very much the, the debates that we considered and developed in the consultation paper. But I would echo Jeremy's point that, you know, the smoke-free legislation was brought in on the grounds of really um, robust evidence on the harms, very, um, very harms of second-hand smoke, um, which is why our consultation focuses on the points that you make about young people protecting young people and non-smokers, so trying to achieve that balance, kind of reducing young people's access to them, but also um, reducing the appeal for young people and non-smokers. Um, and how the products, the, the questions in there about how the products marketed um, to those groups. No other panel members? <coughs> yes, certainly. Uh, Sorry, I misrepresented what I was really meaning myself. I didn't mean ban the, uh, came over, I, I wanted to get an earlier when we were talking about banning in public places. That's the ban I'm talking about. Uh, that And have a separation there, uh, I don't think is logical. So it's not the actual banning of the product. but. Treat it the same when it comes to in use in public places. Okay. Uh, has there been any work done on the, the cost benefits of um, the cost benefits of of health, reduced deaths? Uh, has there been any work done in that at, at all? That you know, there's been a number, you know, a number of well, indirect claim. We've got eighty thousand deaths. A year. This is going to reduce the harm. So, by <coughs> what extent is it going to reduce the harm? What health benefits are are, are being claimed here for for this? Are, is there any, Professor Brin? The best analogy, or the closest analogy, to answer that question would be the pattern of health harms that arise from oral tobacco use in Sweden. Um, Sweden has the lowest lung cancer rates in Europe alongside the lowest smoking rates in Europe. But tobacco prevalence use is the same in Sweden as elsewhere. 
It's just that many more tobacco users use oral tobacco, and that's partly because smokers have switched to oral tobacco, as smokers have switched to electronic cigarettes in this country, and partly because a whole cohort of young people who were going to become smokers have become oral tobacco users and are growing through without the risk. And we know from that experience that in terms of loss of life, um, lifelong use of smoked tobacco in this country takes about 10 years off your life expectancy and lifelong use of oral tobacco probably takes a couple of months or so. It's of that order of magnitude. So on it's a fairly point, trivial risk. On that point, can I... No, no, I'm going to take the panel members always first. Yeah, Remember, Sheila Duffy, like you, you might get in yeah, with it if you. if you don't delay the proceedings of the committee. Uh, 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 Sheila Duffy? I think the health gains from people stopping using lit smoke tobacco are huge and the savings are huge. What we don't know yet is whether for the whole body of smokers these will perpetuate dual use with lit smoke tobacco or people will swap onto them. We just don't know that yet. Should um, just to continue or to clarify my point about oral tobacco, um, this is an inhalation product, so we don't know the long term risks of inhalation of propylene glycol, glycerine, or any of the other byproducts of production. And there are theoretical risks in that, but it, to, to my eye, those risks are of a similar order of magnitude to the use of oral tobacco, which also causes hazards in other ways that electronic cigarettes won't. But in response to Sheila, I entirely agree. We don't know what the long-term pattern of use will be, and that's why we have to monitor use so carefully, repeatedly, frequently, and be able to get those figures in days rather than in a year or two, as we do with, in, in England with many government surveys. Panel members, yeah, Catherine. Sorry, yeah. Just a really quick one. Um, just to make the point that... We, I completely agree with Sheila and John that we don't know the long-term effects yet. We can't. It hasn't been around long enough. Um, but what we do know is that use of electronic cigarettes, as with the use of the oral tobacco products that John was describing, completely removes the byproducts of combustion because there's no combustion, so there's none of those tar, carbon monoxide, all of that sort of stuff. That is completely absent. So in the words of Professor West, who was presenting at last week's summit, the the risks, the re residual risks are going to be of such a tiny order compared to the massive risks of continued smoking that it's almost negligible in his view. Thank you. Rhoda Grant. Can I just um, ask John Britton a question? You talked about um, <coughs> the harms in Sweden and, and the difference. Is that just comparing it with lung cancer or is that all other cancers? Because I think some of the arguments were that nicotine can enhance tumour growth in the leg. Um, I th think there is evidence, well, uh, there is evidence that nicotine can promote tumour growth, but there is not evidence that nicotine causes a tumour. So I think if you develop cancer and you're a nicotine user, it is potentially going to progress more quickly than if you're not a nicotine user. But I have never argued that nicotine is safe. I have argued that it is not the cause of most of the harm from smoking. And in terms of safety, it's probably on a par with caffeine, which causes heart arrhythmias and other problems. Um, I can only speak for the Swedish cancer figures, which in men, from memory in the sort of 25 to 45 group, which is a very good marker of future mortality, is about half. It's certainly the lowest in Europe. Uh, for heart disease risk, things are slightly different in Sweden, but there are many uh, more influences on heart disease risk than just smoking, whereas for lung cancer, smoking accounts for nearly all of it. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I was just keen to know, other than lung cancer, which was obviously a byproduct of smoking tobacco, um, were other cancers, did it appear that they were the same? I, I can't different? answer that, except that I can say that the... Um, risks, the other known risks of oral tobacco are of potentially of esophageal cancer and pancreatic cancer, both of which happen, certainly pancreatic cancer, slightly more highly in oral tobacco users than never users, but less frequently than in smokers. So the risks are all relatively low. Slightly tangential to your question, I appreciate. Any other committee members who haven't been in it wish to come in? No? Richard Lyle. Uh, can I ask, uh, uh, Professor Britton spoke about damage to uh, lungs. Can he 
uh, any of the panel members uh, seen the European Reciprocity Society Annual Congress report in Vienna in September 2012, where a report from researchers from the University of Athens in Greece stated electronic cigarettes could damage your lungs as they cause less oxygen to be absorbed by the blood. Do you have any comments regard any members have a comment regarding that report? Professor Brun? Um, I think inhale, the lung is, you know, I specialise in lung disease, the lung is a fascinating and very complex organ. It's also extremely delicate and inhaling things that you shouldn't inhale probably doesn't make sense. But again, what matters is the relative perspective against uh, inhaling tobacco smoke. And any study that tries, that, that argues, and there are reports out there that say that electronic cigarette inhalation generates as much damage to certain in vitro, so laboratory-based cellular measures, as cigarette smoking, I take with a huge pinch of salt. There's no question that inhaling toxins into your lung causes the lung to, to, to object. But whether that translates into lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease which smoking certainly does, we just don't know. My suspicion is that it will a little bit, but it will be trivial. Catherine? Thank you. I have a fairly intimate working knowledge of that particular set of studies and headlines, um, having been around at the time and had to deal with it on behalf of my industry. Um, it was an egregious bit of reporting, to be fair. What that study actually found was that there was an acute effect on the, the lungs and the respiratory system, um, almost certainly attributable to PG, propylene glycol, which is an irritant. Actually, that's why we enjoy it, because it gives us the throat hit that, that makes it feel like smoking. So, But it's an acute effect. It's very transitory. It doesn't last very long. Within about 10 minutes uh, of stopping, um, that effect is gone. Um, but unfortunately, the way that that study was reported transmuted those fairly ordinary findings into... Daily Mail headlines of magnificent proportions suggesting that this can damage your lungs and cause permanent damage and all sorts of nonsense, which simply wasn't there in the findings of the study. Okay. I don't have any bids for any further. Richard, go on. Just one very quick one. No, you're I, I don't think in England you have registration of tobacco outlets. We, we have that in Scotland, which was one of the moves to actually control illicit uh, uh, sales and it seems to me that it's only a matter of time and I'd like people's comments on is it do people feel that it's likely that actually the criminal fraternity will get onto this area pretty quickly and supply tobacco material to go into these products in some way I mean and if so should we actually limit the sales to registered outlets so that we can make sure that children are not sold as they clearly are being sold everywhere from boot sales at 80% down to, I think, supermarkets, 25% are the best of the Trading Standards Report. Um, do you think that we should actually limit it? And I don't know if that's in the government consultation or not, but I expect it is. Okay, thanks for that, Richard. I've got Andrew and I've got Claire and Sheila. Yes, and yeah, I agree. And I, th I think it should be. I sh it should be limited, um, I think, uh, to, to enable us to have uh, control over, over the, the supply of, of e-cigarettes going forward. Um, to, to avoid the, the very the first thing I said was, uh, was having a child coming into the surgery. And to answer the question that John put is, how did that child get it? Um, by accident. Um, they went in and they bought it thinking it was a toy from a newsagent. Um, that's how they got it, seven years old. Clear. Yes, um, just to answer the question that is in the Scottish Government's consultation, um, it's in there. Um, uh, the proposal is to, to support the, the age restrictions that we propose to introduce for, for e-cigarettes, so it will help trade in standards with their enforcement role. Um, at the moment, we don't know, um, you know, there's no record of who is selling e-cigarettes, um, so in terms of helping them um, in that enforcement and in identifying who is selling e-cigarettes, but also to support them in um, an educational role. Much of the work that Trade and Standards do is about support and education for retailers um, to help them not to make illegal sales. Okay. Um, Jeremy? Thank you, Chairman. Um, in terms of 
registration, I can confirm the UK, they, that England doesn't currently have a registration scheme and doesn't have current plans to introduce one. However, um, in terms of age of sale, we have been working very closely with um, our colleagues in the Trading Standards Institute and locally to ensure that age-restricted sales are um, controlled carefully um, and that these products, once they are uh, restricted by the regulations that we will publish shortly, are well controlled in terms of um, uh, the local arrangements. The question of illicit trade was also raised, and um, uh, recognising the potential role that registration can play in controlling illicit sales. In England, the um, HMRC uh, recently consulted um, on a range of measures to help control illicit trade. What we have seen is that illicit trade tends to fall as, um, uh, as prevalence falls. So the lower you can get smoking, the more illicit trade t tends to come down. So in our ac action on tobacco control, we should be impacting um, on illicit trade. Um, and, and that is certainly uh, a priority for the government in, uh, uh, in London. Sheila. I think it's clear that smugglers will shift anything that makes money, whether it's uh, tobacco, fish or e-cigarettes. So we can expect that to come up in the frame. The retail register in Scotland has been tremendously helpful in that it's allowed enforcement community to engage with retailers and to um, offer them education and some counter to the misinformation they've had from the tobacco industry. I would certainly support um, those selling e-cigarettes and vaping devices being part of that register. But I think we need to go beyond that for tobacco. I think we need to start looking at putting it further out of sight, out of mind, out of fashion. Okay, I think that, that, that brings us to a, um, an, an end to, to, to this session. Um, I'm sure this debate is going to go on and on. Um, and uh, as a committee, uh, we, we look forward to following that debate and um, working with the Scottish Government to, to, to address this issue. Thank you all very much for your attendance here this morning, the evidence provided. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Suspend the meeting. Yeah, we'll suspend at this point.
we, <coughs> excuse me, we now reconvene and move to agenda item number two um, and continue our scrutiny at stage one of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. And this week we have uh, another round table and as before, um, we, we normally uh, introduce ourselves at the round table uh, um, and let's begin with Sarah. Please. No, I should begin, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, my name is Duncan McNeil. I'm the MSP for Greenock and Inverclyde and convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Sarah. Thank you. I'm um, Sarah Crombie. I'm Acting Director of Corporate Services from Victim Support Scotland. Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the Health Committee. Karen Kirk, a Missile's Advocate and Partner at Legal Services Agency, a, a mental health project that acts for people with mental ill health. Nat Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Uh, Kenneth Campbell from the Faculty of Advocates. Dr Lyle, MSP Central Region. I'm Cathy Asante, I'm a legal officer at the Scottish Human Rights Commission. <coughs> Colin Keogh, uh, Edinburgh Western MSP. Jill Stavert, Director of the Centre for <coughs> Mental Health and Incapacity Law Rights and Policy at Edinburgh Napier University. I'm also a member of the Law Society um, Subcommittee on Mental Health and Disability, but Gil Patterson, MSP for Clydebank and Mulgay. I'm Jan Todd, I'm a solicitor and I'm here representing the Law Society's Subcommittee on Mental Health and Disability. Rhoda Grant, a MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Thanks, Ap. thanks, thanks very much. Um, Rhoda, can you open up please and uh, we'll take it from there. And I, I should say I always look to the panellists first before the committee member. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I ask about the victim notification scheme and ask um, the witnesses whether they think the balance is right between the needs of the victim and indeed the needs of somebody who is probably mentally ill at the time of committing a crime? Anyone want to pick that up, Sarah? Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Um, it's a very complex and complicated area to um, gain a, a fair balance between um, victims and witnesses and, and patients. Um, Victim Support Scotland welcomes the provision of information to victims of mentally disordered offenders um, and we believe that every victim should be heard and should have a voice right throughout the assessment process um, and also that information should be proactively provided to victims and um, in an appropriate manner, so whether this is um, by letter, telephone call or email, in a timely manner and also in plain English. Um, what we have found from victims that we have supported through the process is then that there is, or there can be duplications, there can be gaps and it would be good to streamline the system under one scheme so that victims of, victims of mentally disordered offenders do receive that proactive information, which is so crucial for them to understand the system as well. Anyone else? <clears throat> Jill, did you, did you press your speak button? Yes. I would advise everyone to do that. <laughs> Thanks no, very much. To not, to. not to do that. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> you don't need to do it. You'll be pressed, there will be press for you. <laughs> um, Jill, Thanks. Whilst I, th I think that the supplying of information is a good thing and that the amendments um, that, that have been um, replicated in the current bill as, as a result of the Co Scottish Government consultation are welcome, I think we have to be very careful um, that um, mentally disordered offenders are not discriminated against relative to the rest of the population, um, offender population. Um, sharing of information, obviously, um, is a matter, matter which impacts on someone's private life and that should only be um, um, personal information about them should only be shared in a proportionate and legitimate way. Rhoda? Can I ask what you mean? You don't need to press your button. <laughs> um, what you mean about personal information? Um, victim notification schemes tend to be about um, when someone is going to be released so a victim knows where they're likely to be released to. Um, to allow a victim to prepare themselves for that event. Um, what other kinds of information do you, do you envisage being shared as a balance right in the bill? And you know, is there something in the bill that you think should not be shared? 
I think it, it's a matter of um, discrimination or, or dis a discernment in each in individual case. I think so sometimes informing where somebody lives, whether the, 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 the individual concerned has committed a relatively minor crime, would, would not be um, a, a, a proportionate um, response to the situation. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for that, and I, I agree and yes. acknowledge the concerns that you, that you that you make. Um, however, when it comes to victims and witnesses of crime, then they do require, or what they require, is the information so that they, if they choose to, can put any safety plans in place. Um, they don't bump into the offender when they're out, um, you know, on on. Um, you know, temporary release in the community. It's this style of information that's required and this type of information that is proactively required by victims and witnesses. So they have a choice what they can do with that information. Gareth Campbell. Um, yes, I, I uh, think that the um, important uh, thing from the point of view of uh, discrimination uh, raised by Jill is uh, that the scheme uh, operate um, in uh, the same uh, useful way, um, irrespective of the character of the offender. In other words, um, we shouldn't uh, stigmatise people who are offenders and who were mentally disordered at the time of offending. Um, subject to that, I think the balance which is uh, struck uh, in the scheme uh, is, uh, proposed in the bill is appropriate. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Chan Todd. Chan Todd, right. Um, yes, I would just agree with um, what my colleague has said, that um, the Law Society were concerned that it had to be the same as, as other types of offenders, the victim notification. And the one other thing we'd noted was that um, the bill is going to consider um, regulations or guidance on what would be exceptional circumstances for not giving out that notification. I think it's important to discuss what would be in what would be in exceptional circumstances, what the government would think that would be, what would be appropriate for that. So further guidance is probably needed on that. What would you think would be inappropriate in that, or appropriate indeed in that? <laughs> um, well, what I would you know. be concerned about? I suppose it takes into account the personal circumstances of the situation. If somebody's going to be endangered by giving out certain information, then that might outweigh the need to give the victims information. But you'd have to kind of design guidance around what would be and what would not be exceptional circumstances. Yep. So just to come in there, yeah, I think we, we would agree, we would feel that there needs to be a proportionate response on the basis that um, the tribunal will be looking at a care plan for the care and treatment of the patient as well. So if there was any uh, concerns about releasing information which might have a negative impact on that care plan and on that treatment progress, then there should be an opportunity to, to try to stop the provisions taking place. Any other comments on that, Cathy? Uh, just to pick up on the comments that you made about um, the need for parity between mentally disordered offenders and non-mentally disordered offenders, we would certainly agree with that and we were pleased to see that the change had been made from the draft bill so that this now ap applies to um, offenders who are on compulsion orders and restriction orders. But we did note that the bill provides for Scottish ministers to have the power to amend that so that it applies to people who are not on restriction orders, so would just be on compulsion orders, which may only be for, for minor offences. And um, we were just not certain why that, that power needed to be there. Does anyone else get concerns about, about that level of... Uh, Gil Patterson. It's also on a, a rights issue, but this time it's the rights of the patients that I'm going to ask a question on. And it's the fact that managers presently have the power to uh, move a patient uh, from one hospital to the other or to the state hospital. And presently that's 12 weeks. But the suggestion in the bill that it should be cut to four weeks, 28 days, same thing. 28 days, so I wondered what the panel thought about that measure, the, the ups and downs of that. Cathy? Um, we, we did have some concern around that that, um, that reduction of time, which is, is quite a, a dramatic reduction in the, the time scale. Um, a transfer to the state hospital does have a significant impact on an individual's autonomy, their, their right to private and family life, and so um, any restriction on that would need to be justified. Um, we, the justification in the, the policy memorandum was to bring this timeline in, in line with other appeals. Um, 
that was one of the justifications, but we think that there's a reason why the timescale um, for this type of appeal is longer than others because of the seriousness of the consequences of moving to the state hospital and also the complexity of these cases where someone is that unwell. Um, the other justification was that it was not to delay treatment for someone who, who was unwell and, and um, wouldn't be able to be treated in the time that the appeal was going on. But um, the Act already has provision for someone to be transferred pending a decision and an appeal if it's necessary. So we don't see that as adequate justification either. Anyone else? Um. Those comments, and we definitely do agree with, with what's been said. Um, there's specific provisions throughout most of the Act which relate only to state hospital patients. So on the basis that I can see the rationale about bringing the, no, the appeal period in line with other periods, um, the state hospital is unusual to an extent. It's treated that way within the Act, and there are various concerns for patients who um, are subject to detention in the state hospital that are not relevant to, to other patient detention. Um, we would also note as well, for example, <coughs> that a transfer for uh, treatment direction, for instance, can only be appealed after the first six month period. So sometimes the patient's right to challenge has to be at the time or thereafter when the transfer takes place. And there is a lot of work that a solicitor might need to do because of the complexities of state hospital transfer. And we would uh, regard 12 weeks as being an appro a, a appropriate period for that appeal to take place. No other responses. Nanette Mellon. That's, that's um, fine, I think. It's just a, a number of witnesses have highlighted areas where they consider there would be merit in primary legislations, legislation, but not included in this bill. And one that strikes me is the, the use of forced covert med medication and restraint, which there's um, really very little about in the 2003 Act's code of practice. And I mean, there's been a number of representations to Parliament from people who feel very strongly about this, particularly the, the use of covert um, medication. And I just wondered what the views um, around the table are on this. Do we have any views around the table on that? Yes, Certainly John. Raised that as an issue that they would like to see included if there was that possibility. Um, we believe that there wasn't sufficient guidance out there at all at the moment um, and that anything would be useful. So yes, we were keen to see that included. Anyone else, Kathy? Um, I would just like to echo that. We have also raised that in our, our written evidence. It's an area where we think there's quite a lot of confusion in practice and we think it would be beneficial to patients in protecting their rights but also to staff in, in knowing where they stand if there were there was more guidance in that area. Jill? Yes, I'd like to echo what Jan and Cathy also said because we raised that in, in our response to a call for written evidence as well. Richard Simpson? Yes, um, I was particularly interested in a comment in one of the bits of evidence that we had that the radical interpretation of Article 12.4 CRPD by several human rights experts advocates that legal capacity cannot be denied on the basis of disability and that decision making be supported not substituted and therefore the removal of guardianship and the abolition of laws providing for compulsory treatment of mental disorder now that clearly is a pretty radical view but my question is given that sort of view is out there and the UN apparently has uh, published general comment on, to this effect in relation to rights of persons with disabilities. And I don't know if you read the evidence we had from Steve Robertson last week, but it was quite powerful in terms of learning disability. I just wonder if anyone has any comments about the act in front of us, whether any of it is moving us in the wrong direction relative to that comment. I mean, given that I don't, I, don't, I personally don't, sorry, I should say I've you know, been a psychiatrist. so. Uh, fellow of the college. So, uh, you know, I don't see us abolishing compulsory detention in, in certain circumstances. That's the law at the moment. But given those radical views that are out there, is what we're now doing with this act, this amendment, going to move us inappropriately in any way in the wrong direction? Jill? No, you don't need to. You don't need yeah. to. Yeah. Don't listen to me. Um, <laughs> what's the general first rule comment? Here, don't. It's ignore it and that's it. <laughs> Forget about the button. <laughs> what the general comment um, it g gives us the opportunity to do, and I, I, I appreciate that it is extremely radical, and um, 
I, I think most jurisdictions will struggle with um, abolishing um, completely um, non-consensual um, non um, treatment for, for mental disorder. But what it does provide us with is an opportunity to revisit what we understand as capacity and the extent of capacity and exercising legal capacity. And also, um, because the general comment very much promotes supported decision making, um, that we look at the forms of existing forms of supported decision making and uh, other, alter, um, other forms as well so to enable um, patients to be f full partners in a shared decision making process. The Act, as it currently stands, pro does promote um, with its underlying principles the, the notion of shared decision making, but if um, patients are, are additionally supported then they will be more equal players in that. So I think it op opens that opportunity. Um, just to, to go on, um, very, very important forms of um, supported decision making are obviously advanced directives, um, and I feel that that should be promoted more, and there should be a duty on medical staff to encourage um, patients to, to um, make advanced statements um, uh, in, in the Act um, as amended. Also, um, independent advocacy is a very important as aspect of supported decision making and I noticed that that really hasn't been covered in the, the proposed amendments. It should be reinforced particularly given the provisions in section 259 of the existing legislation. Thanks. Um, yes. I, I think yeah. that there is a there's a wider challenge out there in terms of, of responding to this general comment and, and it is a radical interpretation. It's something that will need to consider very carefully if we are going to make broader changes to our, our system of compulsory detention. But in the meantime, we do think that the, the issues that, that Jill has mentioned are very important to take forward to show that we are taking steps to advance supported decision making as much as possible. There are opportunities within this bill in relation to advanced statements advocacy. And I think also looking carefully at the named person provisions to make sure that they actually do what they set out to. Um, I don't think those are the three real opportunities in this bill to at least begin to respond to the general comment. Okay. Kenneth? Um, I, um, I broadly agree with Cathy. Uh, uh, I, I think that um, the structure of um, this bill taken together with existing provisions in the 2003 Act uh, about uh, support for advocacy and, and the general uh, trend towards um, patient involvement in a, a, a decision making uh, is not um, uh, uh, wholly incompatible with the uh, the general comment, which certainly is a is is, is a radical approach. Um, the question is uh, the extent to which um, further primary uh, legislation uh, is the appropriate way forward, or uh, whether uh, it, the case might be for uh, revisiting uh, the code of practice, uh, which was uh, issued when the 2003 Act was originally. Uh, passed, uh, and it might be that uh, uh, the time is right for uh, revisiting some of these important issues uh, in a in a systematic way. Uh, uh, by that means, Cam. Um, the, the concern that I wanted to, to raise, um, having regard to one of the principles of the the, the UN uh, declaration, is, is participation, and the proposal to extend the short term detention period by. A period of 10 days and not five days is, is our main concern with regards to the amendments and the question which Dr Simpson raised is, is quite right um, on the basis that we're now looking for more participation for patients, more effective participation. Is it right that they have to um, wait a further period of time before they call before a mental health tribunal for a compulsory treatment order? Uh, we very much feel that that's not right. Um, and we think it does affect their ability to participate in the process itself. Um, and if the proposals are to extend the period from five days to ten days as they currently stand, it means that it's ten working days. And if you add the time of a short-term detention certificate, an emergency detention certificate, and the extension of ten days with the working uh, day element, then you may be looking at someone being detained for over seven weeks before they actually appear before a mental health tribunal. So we would definitely say that that does not comply potentially with the ECHR and Article 5, but also doesn't uh, promote participation of the patient. Bob, would you want to ask some questions yeah, about yeah, this extension? No, it was that, that, that was going to be my next my, my question anyway. Can we maybe flesh out a bit before we go? Are there were opportunities uh, to come in 
Yeah, I, I, maybe worth just saying, that for, I'm, I'm delighted that this Parliament's actually bound by the European Convention and, and Human Rights and hopefully what will be uh, on an ongoing basis and it's no bad thing that challenges the legislation that we scrutinise, that's kind of why it's there. Um, we did hear evidence in our first evidence session uh, in relation to the, the need, and obviously people will debate whether there is a need to, to potentially extend it in some cases from five to ten working days, was in relation to prepare a variety of reports, including a variety of family reports, and if there's a named person getting getting their details, and that if um, in some cases, and it wouldn't be used as a standard, uh, in some cases it may actually be beneficial uh, to individuals, so they're not going through to, for repeated uh, tribunal um, uh, disposals to decide what's best for them. Now, I'm, I wish I'm delighted I'm not a lawyer. I don't mean it flippantly. That I'm not a lawyer, but the, the word proportionate, I think, comes up in, in relation to the European Convention on Human Rights. So I suppose my question would be, is there a balance to be struck uh, in terms of in exceptional circumstances where there is in a proportionate need to prepare all reports for a tri tribunal to make an informed decision? would this be compliant with the human rights of the individual? Because I was looking at some of the evidence, and the evidence does seem to be quite black and white in terms of this contravenes human rights. And I'm just wondering if it is actually a grey area, and if it's about the checks and balances in the system, the policing of the system, and making sure that uh, you know advocacy groups and the Mental Welfare Commission are taking a view and checking on this. So as a matter of course, do witnesses have concerns in terms of human rights? Or do you think there's a way of extending in exceptional circumstances the five to ten working days, which would be compliant with the human rights of the, well, irrespective of what they have or have not done, the vulnerable individuals who, who, who still have their own human rights needing to be protected uh, by the state? We can come back to you, Karen. But is there anyone else? Ka Kathy, did you see your hand? Yeah. Kenneth? Yes. Um, our issue with the proposal as it stands is that the extension is a, a blanket across the board extension from five to ten days and we, we absolutely recognise that there are exceptional circumstances and lots of very good reasons that people will need more time to prepare for hearings but I think that the um, existing provisions to um, postpone a hearing until such time as people are ready are, are designed to achieve that and that's entirely compliant with human rights to, to give people time to, to be ready to argue their case. Um, I uh, am aware that the Mental Health Tribunal has, has given evidence that the number of repeated hearings has dropped to somewhere around 20 to 30 per cent. And what we would query is whether that is a sufficient justification in a proportionate way um, for a blanket extension for, for everybody um, of the, the time of the short-term detention certificate. We think that if there are circumstances where more time is needed, then it may be that a hearing needs to be postponed. But doing it in this way, where everyone's um, detention is extended, is not the way to go about it. Um, the society agrees with both what Karen was saying and um, what Cathy is saying that we didn't feel maybe five years ago when the Manus report was drafted maybe that was an issue and maybe I should also declare that I sit on the tribunal so I'm a convener of tribunals so I have first hand experience of this um, I don't find in recent times that that has been a big issue. The patient obviously has a right of appeal during the 28 day short term detention certificate period. If they wish to instruct a lawyer at that point, they can appeal. So, so they have that right then. And many do appeal during that period and then appeal again when their CTO application is made. Um, and the tribunal doesn't always get told whether they've had a previous appeal or not. Now, I take on board that some patients are so unwell at the start, they may not even be able to instruct a lawyer at that point or seek an appeal. So it's very important that they get an early opportunity to have that brought to a tribunal. If at the point where, they, you know, within the five days, um, the application for a CTO by the uh, mental health officer has been made and it's brought to a tribunal for a hearing, um, Quite often now, the patient is ready, the solicitor is ready to proceed. However, I don't know that a blanket extension of five days is going to provide any significant benefit to a patient who has just instructed their lawyer or the lawyer needs to get an independent medical report because it will take longer than five working days, usually, to get a proper independent medical report before they can have a full hearing. In the meantime, the patient's rights are protected because they will be having a full hearing on 
at which, although the patient maybe can't make full representations based on their own medical evidence that they've um, sought separately, the tribunal will be making clear that they need to be satisfied that all the tests are met at that stage alone for the patient to be detained. So their uh, human rights are being protected at that point. And any order then would be an interim order to allow that representation to be fully explored and expanded on by getting the independent medical report. So we were of the opinion that at the moment there isn't any benefit on a a blanket extension of five working days. One, because um, we don't think that there's a particular need for it now. And there was a secondary point that we made in our written evidence that by extending it and then trying to deduct it from any future detention period, that could cause more confusion and uncertainty when dealing with um, potential reviews from working out how long did the patient um, that extend to and then having to deduct that from a period of time uh, whether it's your 56 days for two interim extension or uh, two interim CTOs or the period of six months for a full CTO being granted. Kenneth? Uh, can I answer the question directly about um, exceptional circumstances? Um, uh, it seems uh, to me to be uh, uh, unlikely uh, that um, if it were decided to uh, introduce um, a clause which said that uh, in exceptional circumstances uh, a, a greater period of time um, might um, uh, be granted, uh, that that of itself uh, would be disproportionate and uh, not convention compliant. So I think that the committee could be reassured on, on that front. Um, the whole uh, aim of the involvement of the tribunal in this, uh, uh, the scheme of uh, the Act is uh, to ensure so far as possible that the convention rights of uh, patients uh, are uh, um, uh, properly uh, addressed. Uh, and uh, if uh, it truly were exceptional circumstances, then my view would be that that, would be, um, that wouldn't cause a convention problem. Can do you want to come back in any of that? And then, Richard, do you want some further questions? Yeah, no, I agree with um, what my fellow, fellow uh, panel members have said about it. Um, very much we think the existing provisions do provide the opportunity um, for a patient to participate and also the time to prepare, which I, I think that's what uh, Mr Doris had said. Um, the benefits of a, an earlier tribunal are quite vast and obviously depend on the individual circumstances of each case but for example a tribunal at a, a first hearing can direct um, certain matters to take place um, for the next hearing and can deal with issues with regards to the named person and can also deal with preliminary issues with regards to maybe the application and um, how competent the application is in terms of the act itself. So there's a number of uses that uh, an earlier hearing um, can have for a patient. Um, not least the practical use that an early hearing can have about focusing what the issues are in a patient's case and very much that is invaluable for a patient who is for example opposing a hospital based order but is not opposing a community based order and really challenging at the beginning the RMO and the mental health officer as to what they have been thinking, why they think hospital based detention is the least restrictive option in terms of the general principles of the Act and very much it can be effective in being able to put that view across so that quite often when you get to a second hearing, the, the second hearing then really you have a different case at that point, the patient is maybe better. The focus has been taken to maybe a community-based order and it's definitely the case that we do definitely feel that if there's two hearings in a case, that does not necessarily mean that there's been disadvantage to the patient or certainly that um, they um, ha have been caused upset. They direct that and they instruct their solicitor in most cases. So, um, you know, d definitely we think there's a benefit to it. The only one other point that I would raise, I think, from something that Jan had said, is that um, about instructing an independent report and whether or not practically we could do that in every case in 10 days. Um, having looked at a lot of the cases, and I, I did some research for today, I mean, we're generally looking at from the day of instructing an independent doctor at about 30 days until we get the, 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 the written report in. 
Yes, uh, these doctors do it over and above uh, their normal patient work in their own local authority area. We are relying on them to be able to allow an effective system for the patient and um, it, it does take, for an effective and appropriate report, it, it does see, so, take some time for that to be put together. Um, so we would not want it to be reduced and then an expectation on doctors to produce a report in an unreasonable amount of time. Um, I should also say that in some areas, obtaining a specialist psychiatric report on an independent basis, for example, an adolescent report, an eating disorder report, can be very, very difficult to identify someone uh, to do that report. So, um, again, saying that we would be able to do that in 10 days is, is probably quite unreasonable from a, from a practical point of, point of view. Okay. Bob? Just, I'm, I'm probably more confused now than I was at the start. Well, I think Mr Campbell gave me some ideas and Mr Hogan to look over your statement again quite clearly an official report because there was lots in it but uh, Ms. Kerr, I thought you were almost arguing towards the end there that um, if you know if if clients and of patients need an independent report commissioned <coughs> then that wouldn't start after the 28 days that would start at the beginning of the process wouldn't it? No, we may not get instructed until an application for a CTO is actually lodged. In actual fact, you have to also bear in mind that these, these, these patients are unwell. So quite often they may not become well enough to instruct a solicitor until 24 to 48 working days before a hearing. Um, so um, in, in this process as, as well, I suppose I should have said, as well as obviously having to see people that are detained and so obviously can't come into your office, um, you're obviously having to deal with people that have fluctuating mental health as well. Um, but just, I thought the reason that that's really helpful because yes. we're, we're kind of teasing our way forward as a committee in, in, in relation to this. I thought that might have been the reason why you would need the additional time. Um, yes. That's why I thought almost you were kind of, you know, almost arguing for the extension. But Mr. Mr. Campbell's comment came there, I think, might, might be the one that would be helpful to tease out a little bit more. Because I think, and this is what I would quite like clarification on, might be suggesting that actually it's not about whether there's a blanket extension from five to ten days, it's about whether, if it's ever used, if it can be justified as being proportionate and reasonable on a variety of grounds, then it would um, potentially be compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights. So having the, the five to ten day extension in itself as a blanket ruling only becomes an issue if it's applied inappropriately. So if it's applied appropriately, or can it be applied? I suppose what I say, if it's applied appropriately, is there a breach in the European Convention of Human Rights if it's applied appropriately? And if that is the case, do we need to put greater, do we need guidance in when it should or shouldn't be used? Or do we allow that to the good judgment of those who are seeking to, to extend it? I hope that's clear. I know what I'm trying to say, Mr Campbell. I'm just not sure I'm articulating it very yes, well. Yes, um, I, I think... Uh, uh, what, what I under, uh, un, un, understand uh, uh, Mr Doris to be saying is that uh, um, uh, is um, uh, a provision which provides for an automatic um, uh, extension uh, to 10 days as opposed to the existing five days um, uh, problematic um, in itself um, uh, or do we look at uh, the way in which um, it, uh, an extension might be um, uh, the reason an extension might be uh, given in an existing case. Perhaps I didn't make myself um, sufficiently clear uh, when I was uh, uh, answering uh, the question earlier. Um, uh, if the um, uh, existing text were to be changed in such a way that it were uh, to say that uh, the um, period of five days could be extended in exceptional circumstances. Um, uh, speaking for myself, I don't see a convention difficulty with that. Um, there's then a second question about whether um, a, a blanket extension from five days to ten days, um, uh, whether that would give rise to a convention problem. Um, and there, um, I suppose we are into the issue of proportionality. Um, and in thinking about that, the, um, at the committee, and no doubt the Scottish Government, will be mindful of uh, the evidence which the committee has already had from the tribunal 
about the uh, number of cases in which this is, this is an issue and the reasons uh, for that. Um, and I would have thought that in um, working out whether um, a rule is disproportionate, one would have to have, have that in mind. Um, I'm not sure that I can be drawn much further on the answer to whether or not it, 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 it wouldn't be convention compliant to have a, um, have a, have a blanket extension. Um, I, I suspect it probably um, would not be um, uh, unduly problematic from that point of view. But I certainly think that the, um, the ability to extend in exceptional circumstances from the existing five, uh, I don't see a convention problem with that. Thank you. It's a very important one, uh, 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 convener. I'm grateful for the evidence we've had so far. As I understand it, the reason for suggesting an extension from five to ten days is to reduce the number of repeat hearings. That was the in, in McManus. And the number of repeat hearings has, in fact, as Jan Todd has said, reduced quite significantly already. So the exceptionality rule seems to me to be really important here. But if for example, is going to save a repeat hearing, and the, the, the patient, their named person, the person advocating on their behalf or their legal representation seeks an extension for five or ten days, doesn't seem to me to be of critical importance because the individual themselves is seeking an opportunity to prevent having more than one hearing. So if that was laid down as exceptionality, or you know, if all the ten days was exceptionality, would that be okay? Um, and then we come to Karen Kirk's evidence, which is if a specialist report is required or an independent report is required, there's going to be a repeat hearing anyway because it's 30 days and there's no way that can actually be undertaken within what we have been talking about today. So that would be a quite different setup. Can I just check that I'm clear on that and have, have comments on the first bit? Uh, my concern with any exceptionality change from the blanket extension which we were opposed to anyway to, to exceptional circumstances would be that well, how would they be described and who would be deciding when to have a hearing within the 10 day period as opposed to the 5 day period as Karen said if the patient then needs further um, time to prepare his case by getting specialist evidence you're going to need a further hearing anyway um, so does the extra 5 days make a difference to that or are you going to have extra multiple hearings which are not going to be helpful to the patient and um, so I'm not sure I see a great need to have that but that's just my own view of this I mean obviously we the Law Society was consulted on the general view of extending um, for five days and the consensus around our table was pretty much that we didn't feel that was necessary and that it would be less um, compliant with the ECHR um, for the patient's point of view and having a later hearing than an earlier one. So I, I think I'm still of the same view that um, I would prefer the, the current situation both from the patient's protection um, and for the point of not having multiple hearings, I don't think it's going to save a lot. But I'd be interested in hearing what anybody else thinks exceptional circumstances would merit and who would be deciding the exceptional circumstances. Would you leave that to the tribunal service themselves, that the applicant for a CTO would then have to request that here's the exceptional circumstances and here's why we want a hearing set um, within 10 days instead of within five days? Anyone else want to come in at this point or respond to any of that? Yes, Kenneth. Um, I think as far as um, uh, exceptional circumstances, it would be on... Uh, uh, generally, I would expect it to be the person who says there are exceptional circumstances. They would have to uh, um, set that, uh, show why. In which generally with a CTO is uh, the MHO, the mental health officer, or what the patient thought, I'm going to need longer. The patient solicitor said, I need longer. It, it's the practicalities of all that. It's how yes. that's actually going to work before you've already got a hearing set up. And at the first hearing, you find out, well, actually, the patient wanted it to be a few days later because his mum couldn't attend. The named person is very important, couldn't attend. I, I can just see some practical difficulties. Um, as, as, as you know, there's already... Um, a, a uh, plenty of, of experience of um, uh, applications for um, uh, adjournments um, 
uh, for exactly uh, those sorts of reasons. And I suppose uh, what we're really drilling uh, down into um, the conflict um, between the desire, desirability of an early resolution and the desirability of avoiding multiple hearings. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be uh, that um, uh, it's impossible to get um, a, a complete resolution of that. And so what um, is uh, being sought is the most um, uh, effective way of reducing the number of uh, cases in which there are multiple hearings to a minimum. And I'm not sure whether the uh, committee had a sense from the evidence of the tribunal that they have reached that point yet or whether they think there's still further work uh, which um, can be done. I, I don't, um, uh, and the faculty doesn't have a view about that. I think part of the discussion that, that's taking place is about um, how the determination is going to be made about whether there are exceptional circumstances. And essentially, the system that exists at the moment in order allowing you to seek an adjournment of the hearing and, and have a second hearing allows you to argue that at the first stage there are exceptional circumstances that mean that you need to, to put it off until a second hearing. So I think that there's provision there for a tribunal to decide that in the format of a hearing where they actually hear evidence and, and discuss some of the things that, that Karen brought up. Um, I think the alternative is that if there were an exceptional circumstances clause that, like we're discussing here, that you would have essentially a paper hearing where the tribunal service would look at what you're saying your exceptional circumstances are and, and make a determination at that stage. And so I think it's really a question of, of what the <coughs> the need for um, assessment of the evidence is, what's, what's the preferable way of determining that. Um, in my view, having um, the, the system that we have now, where, where you have a hearing that you go to and, and the tribunal considers whether more time is needed, is appropriate. Okay, John. No point. Um, when we looked at the managed review at that time, uh, almost 50% of cases were being continued at a first hearing, but that's now been reduced to 20 to 30%. And a lot of cases coming before the tribunal will be opposed. So how, how low can that figure go really to allow someone to have effective participation in the system? Um, and patients are going to oppose these applications by their very nature. And at this stage, you know, our view is that the system actually works. And as Cathy has said, that the first hearing does allow that involvement, participation of the patient, but also allows the involvement of the mental health tribunal as well to look at the issues and to direct um, uh, orders and such like that they might need. There's a full set of rules for the mental health tribunal that go in addition to the Act and it gives them that flexibility to be involved at an earlier stage in the process, which in our view benefits the patient. So it's really just about at McManus, it looked like the figures were about 50% and is it justified now given that that's been reduced? We definitely think it has been reduced on a number of fronts, but for example the mental health tribunal does now use video technology for evidence. Um, doctors who are busy give evidence um, on occasion on the telephone. So there has been a lot of developments since McManus, which we think will have reduced the figures about going from a first hearing. But uh, make no mistake, I mean, a lot of hearings will go from a first hearing because by the very nature they're opposed and they're contentious because the patient is not agreeing to be in hospital into the care plan. And I suppose the objective is, is to reduce that figure below the 20% and it, it doesn't seem to be a consensus that that'll, that'll happen with it, yeah. this evidence panel anyway. Bob, do you, you, I, don't, I don't want to prolong it because we've spent just, a bit of time. You know, just certainly really, really briefly, in fact, there's no need for witnesses to come back, but I think I should probably clarify, I should be very careful with the, the words I use in front of uh, lawyers or those with legal experience because uh, uh, Ms Todd, when asked about you, you, compliance with the European Convention on Human Rights, Ms Todd said it was likely to be less compliant uh, and uh, Mr. Campbell said it would not be unduly problematic. So no clear either, no clear answer either way, which I thought I thought I thought was just fantastic. But of course, it was myself that said exceptional circumstances. What I had in my head was I didn't want an extension to be routinely used just to work to a deadline to unduly prolong. So let's not get hung up on exceptional circumstances. Those were my words, convener. But I think having heard the evidence, and the committee will have to consider. But I've heard the evidence. Um, I think every case is clearly an individual case with its own unique circumstances. So I'm more drawn towards the need for a, a general power to extend to 10 days been taken. It's whether it's used routinely 
or whether it's used appropriately in the individual case. But that, that's just, I wanted to clarify the language. It was myself that set that here running in terms of exceptional circumstances, but I have actually found the exchange helpful, so thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Do any other committee members want to come in at this stage? Richard? Oh. I suppose just to finish, just to I suppose defend lawyers here, um, that obviously it wouldn't be challenged. So um, if someone is going to be detained, it's not been challenged past uh, seven weeks. Certainly, I think it would be statable that there could be a challenge on the compliance of, of the provision. So um, I suppose it would be watch the space if, if that is certainly what happens. I mean, definitely we feel that the Act currently is compliant and there's a question mark if it were to go to a more automatic uh, change to 10 days about whether or not it would continue to be so. so. Oh, Jones wanted to come in. Yeah, no, okay. yeah, I just like to far reinforce. Far be it from me to stop this discussion. If you want to, you, Jill. Just, just like to wholeheartedly reinforce what what um, Karen has just said. If you give scope for for uh, or potential for for um, a violation of Article Five, for example, um, in in the in, in the legislation, then there is the potential that that that, that it will be violated. So better to to. Um, have have the legislation watertight in the first place to minimise the the ability for that to happen. Okay. Richard Lyle. Hey, Richard Simpson. <laughs> this bill is a fairly limited bill, and and we've heard some indication that codes of conduct must might be needed to be reviewed, but also I think one of the bits of evidence written evidence we got was we need to maybe look at the. Um, compatibility between the 2000 Incapacity Act and the 2003 Act and, and that a wider review was needed. And I just, you know, it is quite a broad topic and I don't want to pro prolong our discussion unnecessarily, but I just wonder, you know, this Act is very limited and we have had some people out there saying, you know, we need to consider issues such as autism and such as learning disability and where they lie within the Act. And these are two areas where capacity comes in as an important issue. So I just, if people want to put on the record briefly, uh, if there's something they think that we should be recommending to the government in terms of a broader review that goes beyond this Act, uh, whether that should be happening in a fairly near future or whether it's not something we need to go for at this point in time. Yes, I think that it is important that there is a wider review that takes place of um, our whole system in relation to capacity so that the... Um, interrelation between this Act, the Adults with Incapacity Act and the Adult Support and Protection Act um, and I think that we, we need to look at that partially from the point of view of the, the general comment that we were discussing earlier from the, the UN um, and really having a, a more comprehensive system that, that ties everything together um, and I believe that um, Colin Mackay from the Mental Welfare Commission that um, mentioned this in his evidence and I would really uh, endorse his comments I think that there's a a bigger challenge to be addressed that we do need to do um, in early course. Okay. Anyone else? Jan? Uh, yes, I concur with that. I mean, we'd made written comments about um, you know, incompatibility with the 2000 Act and specifically what powers guardians and attorneys would have to consent to medical treatment under the 2003 Act. That's one area. You've also got the recent Law Commission's report on deprivation of liberty, which is making, obviously, say certain recommendations as well, well that's a whole different area of um, changes, potential changes to the Adults with Incapacity Act, but very important ones. I mean, um, local authorities are, are trying to look at what they are doing right now in terms of, you know, how they're um, treating people and how they're moving people and then whether they're being detained in deprivation of liberty situations. So I think a wholesale look at that area as well would be useful in the future. what uh, Janet said. The Law Commission um, uh, report in particular on proposals to change the law in relation to uh, adults with incapacity is potentially very important um, and if um, it were thought um, appropriate to have a wider review, I don't think the scale of that task should be underestimated. There would be a, a lot which should require to be considered there. Okay. Okay then. Can, yes, I would just agree um, with, with my colleagues on this. I mean, there needs to be major reform of the Adults with Incapacity Act uh, in light of Cheshire West uh, this year and deprivation of liberty. Um, it's not been looked at and wasn't looked at in terms of the 2000 Act. Um, and um, 
we would very keenly press that that is very much looked at in relation to Article 5 for patients and, and for those who uh, in most cases are in the community and nursing homes and such like there needs to be provision and uh, a mechanism here to challenge that um, and currently the provisions under the Adults and Capacity Act we don't fulfil don't fulfil that uh, need. Jill? I don't have very much to add, but just to say that I fully endorse what Jan has, has said in terms of the mismatch between the Act, particularly Section 50 of the Adults with Incapacity Act to Section 242 of the, the, the um, 2003 Act regarding um, substituted decision makers giving consent on behalf of the person concerned, also the deprivation of liberty issue. I think, I think we do need to have a sort of major overhaul of all the legislation in that respect. Okay. I, don't, I haven't had any bids from committee members, haven't they? Any, any other questions? But um, we've had ex extensive um, written evidence, of course, and, and your presence here this morning. We've got just approximately about 10 minutes left in this session. So it's one of those moments that, um, you know, when you get home in the bus, you want to say, no, Richard, I moved on, I'm offering it to the panel. Um, uh, you know, I wish I had said that, or I wish I had uh, just given a bit of evidence to, uh, emphasis to that. So it's a, it, we're at that point where those, I see Cathy's want to take that, 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 that opportunity, but, you know, for just, just for emphasis, uh, emphasis on maybe written evidence that you've heard, or indeed anything you've heard here this morning that you want to leave us with before um, we, we consider the evidence that both written and oral that we've had. Cathy? Yes, um, I wanted to raise a specific point about, about um, appeals against conditions of excessive security. Um, we're pleased that the, the bill does seek to address this, to bring in um, regulations that, so that people in conditions of medium security are able to appeal against um, that being uh, a condition of excessive security. Um, and it appears to apply to people who are on only criminal orders. Um, we think that this provision should be construed much more broadly. Um, the con conditions of that nature of, of excessive security do have a significant impact on a person's private and family life and their ability to determine how they live their life, essentially. Um, and so I think it needs to be thought carefully as to who's uh, brought within the category c that can bring an appeal. Um, it's our opinion that uh, those on c at least those on civil orders in medium secure settings should be, brought, should be entitled to bring an appeal. But we also think that people in low secure settings should be able to appeal against their conditions of security. Um, we know that the argument is that the, the move from there is into the community, but there are different conditions of security, different levels of security in low secure settings. So, for example, the difference between being on a locked ward or an open ward. Um, and it's worth noting that the, the individual in the case that's, that's led to these provisions um, was actually in a low secure setting himself, but would still not be able to bring an appeal under the current provisions in the bill. Um, just the other point to note there is that this is a matter that's been outstanding for a while. Um, the the um, Supreme Court case found that there was a failure by the government to bring forward regulations, and the bill still requires regulations to be brought forward. So we would just encourage the committee to ask for a timetable for when those regulations are going to be brought forward so that it happens as soon as possible. Thanks for that, Cathy. Uh, th does anyone else want to say anything in, in, in respect to the Cathy's statement or, or indeed any other issue? Sarah? Thank you. Um, it's um, really for um, the issue of victims' rights for information. Um, if I could just say that it's the, the hope that Victims Support Scotland, um, that there'll be no restrictions on eligibility for receiving information um, on the release of the offender back into the community. And so when it comes to compulsion orders, then that would actually bring us into line with the EU directive and that victims of crime will all receive information and uh, finally also as well that um, when it comes to being supervised in the community then um, with the the planned um, victim notification scheme covering mental disorders offenders then victims will not be informed therefore there is a risk of them meeting in the community um, and whether the offender is supervised or non-supervised has really no relation to how the impact that that will have on the victim. So we believe that um, they should be notified on all occasions. Thanks, Senna. Karen? It was just one point in relation oh. to 
um, what Cathy had said, that um, we were concerned that it's section 273, that the new section includes patients subject to civil orders, so com uh, compulsory treatment orders and short-term detention certificates, that the old section, sorry, section 264, and the new proposed amendment of section 273 actually removes those uh, persons on civil orders, so just includes those in compulsion orders and restriction orders uh, and transfer for treatment directions, and we consider that that was discriminatory to those patients who maybe are in the state hospital but under a civil order um, for treatment that they would have less rights than they currently have under the Act and we wondered whether or not that was actually the intention uh, of the bill in the first place so um, I would just reiterate what Cathy had said but on the basis of that change we think it might be potentially be discriminatory to some patients who are on civil orders rather than um, criminal procedure type orders. Okay. Uh, John? No, that's really, we're fine. We're fine. Um, Cathy said about the uh, rights of appeal against um, excessive security and low secure units and hospital wards, particularly. Um, we don't think medium secure units, you know, extending the rights of appeal to medium secure units would be sufficient in itself. So we just wanted to um, emphasise that. Anyone else? And uh, you know, a third point of response to what John Cathy. Karen and Sarah's dead. Right, we're going to leave it at that. Can I thank you all very much for your attendance here this morning and giving us your valuable time uh, and, and the evidence, both written and oral, that you provided. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as previously agreed, our next item we will take in a private session. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.